Morant with a running start. Elevate! Oh, oh, it does! Oh, my goodness! Oh. He's done a tie game in overtime. Gasol will turn his heat. It's gone! It's Gasol top. Seven tenths remain. Only now a three. Count it! A 15-point lead for Memphis. And Blake Griffin gets into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took exception. Adams going long. Morant! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He hit it! John Morant gets 70! You gotta be kidding me. Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. The suspension is over edition. My name is Keith Parrish. Today, Ja Morant comes back to face the New Orleans Pelicans and not a game too soon. The Grizzlies had a game on Monday night against the Thunder and they were humiliated. The Grizzlies kind of rolled over and quit in the second half. I believe it was akin to the final half day of school before Christmas break. I don't know, trying to get work done on a Friday afternoon before spring break. They did nothing in this third quarter. They fell down by 31 points. Uh, The game ended uh, in kind of a whimper. But now we focus on what's left of this season, 57 games to go. Before I get into a recap of last night's game and look ahead to what Ja Morant can bring, just a word to let you know that tonight for Ja Morant's season debut in Nashville, we're having a watch party at Nobles Beer Hall. The game is early. It's nationally televised at 6.30 p.m. Come on out. Have a drink. Have some food. Win some prizes. We have some signed photos to give away from Grizzlies players. We have some Grizzlies wrapping paper to give away. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you're there. Bring a friend. Come to Nobles Beer Hall tonight. Hang out with me for a Grizzlies watch party in Nashville at 6.30 p.m. All right. Let's talk about this Thunder game just a little bit. Uh, It was awful. It was a bit embarrassing. It was close for a little bit. The Grizzlies were only down by four with five minutes to go in the first half. Then they kind of let go of the rope. Uh, There was no Derrick Rose in this game. That was a big deal. He hurt his hamstring in the previous game. Derrick Rose is now week to week with this hamstring injury. There was also no Bismack Biombo. He was doubtful before the game. I don't know uh, if they like held him out extra careful just to make sure he didn't get hurt ahead of Ja Morant returning to the roster and ahead of them having to make these roster moves. Like uh, Kenneth thought the junior was waived after the game. Um, we all miss junior. Sad to see him go. But like Kenneth Lawton Jr. was out for this game, I think because they didn't want it to be awkward for him to have to pretend to be part of the team. Because once the game was over and John Morant became eligible to rejoin the roster, well, they were going to waive him. So it was good, I don't know, sportsmanship business uh, for the Grizzlies to not make Kenneth Lawton Jr. be there. So he was out for the game. Uh, also, Bismack Biombo was out for the game. So the shorthanded Grizzlies got even more shorthanded. Uh, Xavier Tillman got a chance to start a game again. Jacob Gilliard started the game. And despite being extremely shorthanded, The Grizzlies did hang in it, and they hung in it because they were making three-pointers. They made six three-pointers in the first, like, five, six minutes of the game. Um, Like, at the first TV timeout, six minutes into the game, the Grizzlies had 18 points. It was all three-pointers. And that would kind of set up the pattern for the game where the Grizzlies basically only scored from the three-point line. The Grizzlies made 19 three-pointers in this game. And you think, oh, 19 three-pointers, that's really good. Yeah, sort of. But when you have 22 points in the paint, that's abysmal. The Grizzlies in this game set a franchise record for the fewest two-pointers made. The Grizzlies had 11 two-pointers against the Thunder. The Grizzlies in the third quarter, which might have been uh, on the short list of worst basketball quarters ever played by the Memphis Grizzlies, they did not make a two-pointer in the third quarter. They only made two field goal attempts total. They made two three-pointers. They were two for 12 on three-pointers. They were zero for seven on two-pointers in the third quarter. They also had seven turnovers. That might be 
the worst quarter ever played by the Memphis Grizzlies. They had no interest in defending. They had no interest in attacking in the paint. Maybe they were just frustrated that Chet Holmgren blocked all their shots. I mean, that was a, hey guys, John Morant comes back tomorrow. I think I'm done. I think I'm out. And that was a kind of give up moment. And I mainly focus on the uniqueness of the stats. Like, we've, we've never seen anything like that. I don't know how to look it up, but I'm almost certain that's the first quarter in franchise history where they didn't make a two-pointer. The fewest two-point field goals in a game for the Grizzlies before this one, you, you got to go back to the Vancouver days in a game where they scored 73 points. They only made 12. So they beat that by one. The fewest uh, two-pointers made in a game in the Memphis era had been 15. They made 11. 11 made two-pointers. 19 made three-pointers. They took a franchise record tying 54 three-point attempts. They also turned the basketball over 22 times. This is the second game. I looked this up. As far as the stats have been kept for the decades upon decades where we have these stats on basketball reference, this was the second game in NBA history where a team had twice as many turnovers as made two-pointers. The 2014 process Sixers, they also had a game where they made twice as many turnovers as two-pointers made. If you remember, that 2014 process team was the last NBA team to start 0-8 at home. So we're sharing a lot with one of the worst teams in NBA history, the 2014 Philadelphia 76ers, a team that was purposely trying to lose all their games. The Grizzlies are not on that boat. Apparently, we're trying to win. The 54 three-pointers. All right. The three highest three-point attempt games in franchise history have all come this season. How did the Grizzlies do in those games? Well, they lost to the Thunder by 19. They lost to the Jazz by 24. And they lost to the Lakers by 27. The Grizzlies offense without John Morant has basically been just like chuck and pray. I believe it's the equivalent of instead of going to work, just buying scratch off lottery tickets, hoping something good happens. I say that as if I'm some kind of really hard worker. I'm not exactly the most industrious person that ever existed. Um, here's a stat. The Grizzlies this season, if they make 14 or more three-pointers, are 0-9. Last year, if the Grizzlies made 14 or more three-pointers, they were 22-4. and The year before that, if they made 14 or more three-pointers in a game, they were 18-3. and so the last two seasons, they were 40 and 7 if they made 14 or more three pointers. This year, 0 oh and 9. If they just take 35 three pointers this season in a game, they're 2 and 15. 4 and 4 if they take fewer than 35 three pointers. Now, a lot of that's the chicken or the egg. Are you taking a lot of three pointers because your players are bad and they can't penetrate and get into the paint? Yes. Are you taking a lot of three-pointers because you're down and just desperate? Maybe also yes. But so far, the Grizzlies offense is horrific. And, of course, we're dealing with significant, a massive injury and suspension problems. Ja's not going to fix all that. Ja's not a good three-point shooter. Yes, the defense will focus on Ja. He will penetrate. We won't have games anymore where we score 22 points in the paint. Ja will score in the paint. The defense will collapse on him. Hopefully, he will kick it out. And when he kicks it out, hopefully, the players make their shots. But guess what? This season so far, the Grizzlies on wide open three-pointers, they're making 34% of them. According to the NBA's tracking data, when there's no player within six feet of our shooters, 34% on threes. The Grizzlies are 30.8% on corner three-pointers. I don't know how you do that. It's really bad. Uh, Santi Aldama, someone I noticed, has especially terrible corner three-point shooting numbers. He's 7 out of 35 on corner threes. I consider Santi to be a pretty good three-point shooter. 
For whatever reason, this season so far hasn't made any corner threes that contributes to the team-wide problem. I mean, Santi for the year is shooting 33%. And you can just go up and down the Grizzlies roster and you understand why this team is uh, arguably the worst three-point shooting team in the NBA. I mean, Bain shooting 38%. All right. His looks are going to get so much easier. Bain's three-point percentage is going to go up. Because right now, most of his three-pointers, I don't, not most, but like, I think like 40% of his three-pointers are unassisted. Previous seasons, most of them, a majority of them have been assisted. So his three-point percentage is going to go up. But like the rest of the roster so far, Jaron, 31.3% on three-pointers. Marcus Smart, when he played, 29.5% on threes. Aldama, 32.7. David Roddy, 29.2. Derek Rose, 34.4. Zaire Williams, 32.1. John Conchar, 33.3% on three-pointers. Luke Kennard played eight games, 37%. All right, that's going to go up once she comes back. Uh, Xavier Tillman, 26.7%. Vince Williams, 37.3%. Good job, buddy. Jake LaRavia, small sample size, 15%. I mean, this has been a nightmare season for a lot of reasons. One of the nightmares is the three-point shooting. The Grizzlies are dead last in the NBA in offensive rating after this game. They have a offensive rating team-wide of 106.7. To put that in context, last season, when John Morant was off the court, so John Morant's not playing. When John Morant was off the court last season, the Grizzlies had a 115 offensive rating. The year before that, I know this is not exactly apples to oranges. The year before that, when John Morant was off the court, they had a 115 offensive rating. They have a 106.7 offensive rating. They don't get to the foul line. They shoot the fifth most or fourth most three points per game. I don't have it in front of me right now. Uh, And they make uh, very, very few of them. Uh, The one guy again making threes is Desmond Bain. He had 17 points. He made three or more threes for the ninth consecutive game. I forgot to tell you last episode that Desmond Bain set a franchise record with his eighth straight game of three or more made threes. He had been in a tie with DeAnthony Melton, the previous holder of that record, for most consecutive games in Grizzlies franchise history with three or more made threes. Bain has a streak of nine straight. Outside of Bain, um, no one else scored. I don't know. Oh, I guess Zaire Williams scored. Zaire Williams has made it an annual tradition of setting his season high in a meaningless game against the Thunder. Last year, he had career highs in points and assists in the final game of the season against the Thunder. Um, that was, of course, the final game of the regular season. That is also known as the Kenneth Lawton Jr. game. In this one, Zaire had 19 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists, and 4 turnovers. But 12 points and 4 assists came in the fourth quarter when both teams cleared their benches. Um, so the Grizzlies finished with three players in double figures. That's like, what, the fourth game in like their last seven where they've only had three players score in double figures? It's so bad. I can just laugh. Hey, John Morant comes back in uh, nine hours from when I'm recording this right now. Uh, Jaron finishes with 11 points. Uh, Not super great. I mean, credit the Thunder. They did a good job, I think, of limiting Jaron Jackson Jr. and perhaps funneling um, players to shoot these three-pointers. Like Jacob Gilliard, he got the start, and, you know, tip of the cap to him. He played pretty well. He made a career-high four threes. He hit four out of his six three-pointers, had 12 points, seven assists, three turnovers. But then everything else, I mean, sorry, Vince Williams Jr., not a score. Xavier Tillman, what happened to you, buddy? Uh, Xavier Tillman had the worst shooting game of his career, 0 for 8 from the field. Of course, three of those were blocked. Um, That did not really help him build his confidence very much. He finished with no points in uh, 24 minutes, 25 minutes played. Zero points, eight rebounds, two assists, a steal, and a block. I don't know what's up with Xavier Tillman. Um, He's now under 40% from the field and from the line this season. No idea what happened to that guy. Um, But he, uh, you know, you you crossed your fingers with the opportunity he was getting with no Bismarck Biombo. He would find his rhythm and become the Xavier we're accustomed to. Not yet. Uh, It was not there. Um, And then, like, you know, the bench, uh, Conchar, no. Roddy, no. Zaire, no. Aldama had nine points and nine rebounds, but only made two out of ten field goal attempts. 
Just a brutal game up and down the roster. Uh, a lot of the issues for the Grizzlies were just that Chet Holmgren was destroying them. Chet Holmgren blocked seven shots. It seemed like the Grizzlies kept doubting that Chet Holmgren would block their shot if they went into it. Like, one of Chet's blocks was outstanding. I mean, a few of them were just amazing. Uh, the block of Vince Williams Jr.'s dunk was awesome. Incredible block by Chet Holmgren. Coming from behind to block that. Several of them were like, what in the world was our Grizzlies player thinking? Why did Xavier Tillman think he could do a little push shot with Chet Holmgren standing right in front of him? Chet Holmgren is the sixth player for a Grizzlies opponent this year to have a game with six or more blocks. Like Wimbenyama had eight against us. I think what Gobert had like seven. Porzingis had six. Maybe Kessler had six. I'm not sure why the Grizzlies uh, keep giving up so many block shots to individual players on the other team. My leading theory is our players are sorry. And that's why they're getting all of their uh, moves rejected at the rim. Um, Vince, uh, he had five points and five rebounds. He made one out of five threes. He had a team worst plus minus in this one. However, I still remain extremely excited about him. Can't wait to see him start at the three alongside Ja and Dez. Uh, a fun note for Vince in the month of December, now eight games, he leads the Grizzlies in rebounds per game. I mean, maybe you wish someone averaged more than six rebounds per game, but Vince Williams Jr. is leading the Grizzlies in rebounds per game in his final eight games. He's also uh, been making three-pointers outside of this one. Um, Gigi Jackson, he got to play the whole fourth quarter in that garbage time. He picked up his first ever NBA points. Congratulations to Gigi Jackson. Scored eight points, made two three-pointers. If you want to get excited about Gigi, sure, why not? We have nothing else. Um no, we have something else. We have we have Ja Morant returning. Um, so looking ahead to the Ja Morant return, the Grizzlies, like I've said, worst offensive team in the NBA. They are top 10 in the defense. That's uh, a silver lining. They're ninth, according to basketball reference. If you filter out garbage time, they're 10th. So the offense is going to get better. The three-point shooting, just regression-wise, you'd think would have to get better. I mean, although, again, a lot of our shooters who are shooting, they're bad shooters. It's not bad shooting luck. It's bad shooters shooting. Um, but the Grizzlies now begin this massive uphill climb, and they've really dug themselves a hole. They're 6-19, and 19, and what are the odds they can get back into it? I've maintained they're, they're remote. Um, I think... Most people are circling or doing some kind of math that's similar to, all right, when John Morant returns, the Grizzlies can win around 60% of their games. They've won uh, right around 61% of their games with John Morant over the past several seasons. So if you do that, all right, that means you can go like 34 and 23 or 35 and 22. If you go 35 and 22, that gets you to 500. That gets you to 41 and 41. Maybe that's good enough to make the play-in. If so, then you become the team in the play-in. Basically, no one wants to face. I would think that would be the case. Um, the specifics of this season, though, I think make that more unlikely than it would have been in previous years. Like 41 wins probably gets you in the play-in every other year that the play-in has existed. But the problem, as I see it this season in the Western Conference, is I'm not sure the 10th seed is going to be 500 or worse. Like right now, if you look at the standings, the teams in 9th and 10th, it's the Rockets and it's the Suns. Both of those teams are two games over 500. I've been pretty down on the Suns ever since they traded for Bradley Beal, but even I don't think this team is going to finish 500. I think the Suns are going to finish well above 500. So, like, I don't think it's likely you catch the Suns. The Rockets are the team we everyone circles. Like, all right, they're going to drop off. No one's going to be surprised if the Rockets finish with a 500 record or worse. The problem, of course, is the Rockets own that tiebreaker with you, so you have to catch the Rockets. And, oh, by the way, you also have to catch the Warriors. The Warriors right now are two games under 500. they They're still going to miss Draymond Green for maybe the next dozen games. The Warriors might truly be terrible if you go 34-23 and 23 over your final 
57 games. If you go 32 and 25, you might even catch them. I don't know. But like, not only do you have to catch the Rockets or someone else, you have to pass the Warriors, and that's just to get into 10th. And my concern is, one of the concerns is that there's going to be 10 teams in the West with a better record than just 500. Like, I don't think the Pelicans are going to fall to 500. I don't think the Clippers are. I don't think the Mavericks are. I don't think the Lakers are. I believe in all these teams. And so the idea of trying to get over 500, I feel like that's a task that's too big. It's possible, but it's not likely. And also when everyone says, hey, the Grizzlies win 60% of their games with John Morant, I don't think it's going to be that good. Or I, I think personally it's going to be more like the end of the year last year when there was no Steven Adams. The Grizzlies still have a huge hole in their front court. The Grizzlies, I think, even if they start Vince Williams Jr. or they keep playing Vince Williams Jr., are going to be a subpar rebounding team at times. And I think their winning percentage is going to be more like what it was last year after the Brandon Clark and Steven Adams injuries. After Steven Adams went out last year, the Grizzlies went 20-16. and 16. That's a 55.5% winning percentage. That is more what I'm expecting this year. We don't even know yet. Once Marcus Smart returns, he's supposed to return into the week, maybe on Thursday or on Saturday. We don't even know once Marcus Smart and John Morant returns if Marcus Smart is, in fact, an improvement over Dylan Brooks and Tyus Jones. We hope he is. That's the plan. But like, we don't even know if that's true in practice yet. So I think penciling in winning 60% of your games, that's a little bit presumptuous. I assume it's going to be more like 55% of your games. If you do that, you still could win 32, 33 games. It's, we're only talking about a, a one or two win difference, but now we're talking about winning like 38 games on the season, which is something I would expect to happen. Like I would assume somewhere between 36 and 39 wins is what the Grizzlies are going to end up with. And I don't think that's going to be good enough to get to 10th. It might be good enough to put pressure on the teams ahead of you. And then, of course, you know, maybe something catastrophic happens to one of those teams. You don't hope it happens, but injuries happen in the NBA. Um, and you could see a team fall off like the Pelicans or the Clippers or maybe the Warriors kind of give up. The Warriors, though, have that situation where they don't control their draft pick. The Trailblazers get their draft pick unless it's top four protected. So you're not going to see the Warriors tank out or anything. So that's why... I'm not optimistic the Grizzlies can make it into the playoffs. Because even if you hit the 10th seed, you got to win two games on the road. You know, and that's single elimination. You have a shot. you got a puncher's chance, but it's it's unlikely. Statistically unlikely. But it doesn't really matter because I'm just ready to watch a team not be horrible. And once John Morant returns, they will not be horrible. The Grizzlies will be good and competitive and... That is what I want to see. And it all starts tonight against the Pelicans. Come on down to Noble's Beer Hall. Watch the game with me and other Grizzlies fans. And hopefully uh, the Grizzlies can begin rebuilding their season. I was almost going to say brick by brick, but that reminds me of all the three-point shooting, so I won't do it. Oh, and I should say one final goodbye to Kenneth Othan Jr. now that he's officially waived. I really enjoyed the Kenneth Othan Jr. era. I don't know if he's going to get picked up by another team. I'm curious to see how he does for the rest of his career. But always remember, we have the Kenneth Alton Jr. game. He's the only rookie ever to score at least 40 points and get at least 10 rebounds in their first ever game. He still holds the franchise record for most points and a half with 35 from that Kenneth Alton Jr. game. So Godspeed, Jr. I'll be cheering for you wherever you end up. All right, that's the episode for today. Hopefully, I'll see some of you guys at Noble's Beer Hall tonight. Everybody else, I hope you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hopefully, you'll join the Patreon, patreon.com slash breakfast. All right, have a great Tuesday. I'll talk to you soon. Go Grizz.